Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Stock Talk podcast here with Invest Like Mike. Uh, we're here August 25th here, and we're going to do an interview with someone who's going to have some interesting stories for us. Uh, this is Phil McKellar. He actually works with Benj Gallander, and uh, we're going to welcome him to the podcast today. How are you doing today, Phil? Hi, I'm very good. Thank you for having me. So we're going to get into a bunch of topics today. Obviously, my, my podcast kind of focuses on the stock market and then generally just investing as well. We talk about gold and other things as well. Yeah. Um, obviously, you have a pretty deep background in the stock market. I'm sure you probably have some other things you do which you can tell us about. Why don't you kind of maybe let the audience know maybe a little more about yourself just so they can get a bit more familiar with you? Sure. So um, as you mentioned there, I work with Benj Gallander and I work with Contra the Herd Investment Newsletter. I've been working with them since 2014 14, on a full-time basis. And I started working with them on a kind of part-time informal basis way back in 2011. Uh, I started investing in the early 2000s while I was still at high school. And I was really interested in the stock market way back then. And that just carried over into my adulthood, I guess. Um, I worked as a financial advisor out of university and decided that while I liked finance and financial advising, I didn't actually like um, a lot of the personal finance stuff that goes into it. So that was a good learning experience for me. I've worked as an analyst from Bloomberg New Energy Finance and for Sustainalytics as well. Um, but I would say that more or less my time and passion and energy has been focused on Contra the Herd and on my own portfolio and on improving my own investment performance over time. Okay. And um, in terms of uh, meeting up with Benj Gallander and everything like that, how did that all work for you? Was it something where, you know, you kind of mutually met and then it just started from there? Was it something where you had to get to know each other for a little while? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I actually met Benj, um, or I found, I, I guess I should say, I discovered Benj by watching BNN. And in my final year at university, I was, um, I was not sure what I was gonna do. I was really interested in finance and business and entrepreneurship. So I was reading a lot of books on investing and a lot of books on finance. And I was really into certain Warren Buffett books. I was watching BNN regularly. And one morning I was making breakfast and I had my computer on the countertop or whatever, and Benj came on. And about five minutes into the interview that he was he was having with BNN, I stopped cooking and I just went over to my computer. I rewound to the beginning and I just sat there and watched. And he he really grabbed my attention. So many things that he was saying were similar to the way Warren Buffett acted, especially as a young investor. And that uh, that really gravitated towards me and. I was thrilled when I then saw that he had a book because I could go read his book. So I did that. I read his book. And from there, I started uh, emailing him some questions. And he was kind enough to get back to me. He's a very open, uh, affable guy. And uh, I certainly benefited from that because we slowly built up a relationship from there. I eventually ended up moving to Toronto and then working part time with him in 2011 on that basis and then full-time since 2014 so that's that's the kind of backstory with Benj and yeah it all it all came from BNN and then the books or or mainly the Contrarian Investor 13 book he had written. Well it's kind of interesting because I, I said to you in the lead up to the interview I said that's kind of how I met Benj I mean I uh, was 26 or something watching BNN and it was just I don't know I would watch it but no one stood out at me where I was like I got to follow that guy. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then when he started speaking, it was just very different from everyone else. He had more of um, almost like a, a confidence about the way he was going about it. And the way he was speaking was very interesting. And I would actually go on BNN and type in Benj Gallander to see when he was on or watch Market Call. Uh, I'm guessing yeah. that this is the book you were talking about. The um, Yeah, that's the one of them. Um, the Contrarian Investor 13 is the other one that uh, I read. That's the one behind me here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There it is in the yeah. background. Perfect. Yeah. I got Warren Buffett over here. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you got a lot of books. In the background. That's great. I should have that in my background. Let me show, uh, I'll just share the screen here uh, for any of the listeners. I'm just showing the Contra the Herd website, which uh, it, it publicly posts uh, the returns that they've had for the VP portfolio and everything that they're doing. And if you dig in a little further here, you can actually see the annual returns here all listed off 
in full. Um, you can even subscribe to their newsletter. So there's a bunch of things going on here and Phil and Benj are directly involved here. Just in case someone didn't see the podcast with Benj Gallander, this is my website here. You'll see I did one with Benj earlier this year and one recently. Uh, you're welcome to check those out, uh, investlikemike.com. There's a podcast section. At the top of the page, I have all the audio links and I'm on Spotify. I'm just showing the Spotify page to the viewing audience. So you can listen to it. You don't have to watch our faces. If you're driving around, you're welcome to listen to it as well. So uh, whatever you want to do. And I mean, that's who Phil's talking about. That's who Phil's working with. And this is what they do, you know. Um, so Phil, uh, are you directly involved with uh, the portfolio here? Do you work in the background with Benj on these things? Yeah, I, I work in a few capacities. The main thing I do is analysis. So I'm I'm working primarily as an analyst. And then I'm helping Ben Stadelman manage the vice president's portfolio. Um, so I have more say these days anyway in in the way that portfolio is directed and what it does. And um, uh, that's that's what I do and how I'm involved with Contra. Okay. And I mean, if anyone wants to check out Phil's uh, information and Benj and everything, I mean, we showed you the websites there. They have quarterly newsletters. Uh, there's a page I showed you where you could sign up for their newsletter. I yeah. think a couple of my viewers have done that, I believe. And then That's great. Some, some YouTube content uh, as well. So feel free to check it out. I mean, um, it's all about exposing yourself to different ideas and being able to decide which people do I actually want to trust and go forward with. So I think I would yeah. encourage encourage people to check out your material there um, for yeah. sure. Now to build on that, because I mean, you might be new to some people even viewing it uh, and whatnot. Why don't you maybe describe your investment strategy and style? Because some people are day traders, some people hold mm -hmm. forever, some people are in between. Why don't you describe yeah. kind of what you do? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, I would say we're somewhere in between. We're not buy and hold forever, and we're not day traders either. For me, there are two aspects of an investment strategy. There is the security selection side of it. What, what stocks or bonds do I wanna own? And then the second is the portfolio management side. So on the security selection side of things, um, as the name implies, we are contrarian investors. So we are looking for things which other people don't like or don't want, things that are beaten up, unloved. Sometimes they're hated. And when you even suggest the name, people run. So that's the kind of stock that we're looking at. And so many people say that they're uh, contrarian investors and that they, you know, go against the grain and all the rest. For me, most of it looks like marketing because when you get down into what they're actually doing, they're not contrarian at all. Whereas what we're doing is we are looking at deep value investments. Most of the companies we invest in, at least initially, they're in some kind of turnaround. Um, there's some kind of problem going on. They've lost a big customer something is not as it used to be. And you can measure that quite easily and see how contrarian we are because none of our stocks are flying high. They're all well below their 52-week highs. Many times they're near the 52-week lows. And further back, because many of our companies are older companies, at least five or 10 years in the case of Benj's portfolio, many of them are well below their three-year highs or their five-year highs. So we're looking for the dustbin companies. We're looking for the things that are really beaten up. And as a result, I think we're very genuinely contrary investors, deep value investors. And the stocks that we're looking at, we're hoping for a hundred percent upside on them. Multi-baggers are even better. And I should say, there are a lot of companies out there that are contrary and crappy for a reason. So once we um, find them or discover companies and are watching them, we try to make sure that the balance sheet is in good stead, Dilution isn't a huge problem because dilution can really hurt. Debt can really hurt. We try to get a really good sense of their customer base, how concentrated their revenues are among, say, five versus 50 customers, because that makes a very big impact to their revenues. And then we try to figure out whether they have a turnaround strategy in place, what that is, if it's feasible, and then if they're aligned with us as shareholders. So if they're selling tons of stock, we don't really like that. If they're buying lots of stock or if they um, say we're the owner founder or they're um, heavily invested for over over many years, we like that too. So that's the, that's the science kind of security selection side of things. On the portfolio management side of things, you, you said at the top there, some people are day traders and some people are buy and hold forever investors. 
And I would say that we are somewhere in between that. Our average hold period is probably somewhere between three and five years at this point, which for a day trader is crazy. That, that sounds like forever. But Definitely. then for someone like Warren Buffett, it also sounds crazy. That's way too short. Yes. So we're, we're somewhere in between. And we're also, um, uh, the, the second aspect of the portfolio management is how concentrated are you? Are you invested in 500 stocks or five? And there we're, again, we're, we're on the more concentrated side. Bench's portfolio typically has between 15 and 25 names in it. And the same thing for the portfolio uh, that ben, ben Stadelman and myself manage. And there's some overlap. So some of the names that Benj will own, we also own and vice versa. But okay. uh, all in all, that's, that's the kind of um, deliverable that our subscribers get is a, is a portfolio that doesn't turn over a ton and has fairly concentrated positions, which we're not day trading all the time. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like that style of being a contrarian. And, um, you know, I'm not even going to pretend maybe that I understand that terminology as well as you might. I mean, you've literally branded yourself that way. <laughs> you, you have a lot of deep research on what you've qualified as being your contrarian approach, right? Right. And some people might think if just a stock dips minimally, they'll be contrarian because it'll go up. But you're taking yeah. a, a different approach than that. That's right. Yeah. Um, maybe if there was a market crash, you might actually approach that same company because it dropped enough, right? That's right. Um, yeah. So, so many opportunities come up in sell-offs like that. For and, sure. Um, many great companies, many outstanding companies just get whacked and everything gets thrown out when the market sells off. So yeah, that's another way to look at it for sure. Definitely. Now I wanted to ask you a question about this. So sometimes when, um, you know, even if I had Ben John, he gave a couple of stock picks. Some people looked at that and said, oh, he's probably crazy. Look how much it just dropped. Why would I buy that? Some people are actually of a different thinking like you and you're saying maybe, well, that makes sense. I know the company. Um, I know even when I went to invest in Florida real estate after the big crash, it was 70 or 80% off. And I felt that they always will, you know, attempt to recover their economy and not let it stay down here. Well, the, the real estate's now at the same price or higher as it was before the crash. So yes. um, yeah. when I went around pitching that to people, they called me kind of crazy or said it was risky. And maybe it was, but my, my understanding was that it would recover. And, and that's what ended up happening. You're using that kind of logic, it seems like, with your stocks. Why is it human nature, do you think, that a lot of people kind of fear the things that other people actually desire for an investment? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think a lot of it comes down to a herd mentality or trend following. So many people, when you see a group of people who are optimistic, they get optimistic. And then on the flip side, when you see everybody around you very, very scared, you get scared too. So, um, you know, the, by and large, the, the, the balance sheets of certain companies won't change hugely between both those scenarios. The only real difference that's going on is, is the sentiment surrounding the companies or the industry. So I think that's what it is. And I think momentum has an incredibly uh, strong impact on, on markets and the way that securities move because people heard, people trend, and they, when they get scared, they get really scared. And when mm -hmm. they're optimistic, nothing can go wrong. And it's just roses everywhere. And I, I think that's what it is. It's, and that's, I think, just a function of the market. Some investors I very much admire and follow. Um, they're called Turtle Creek, based in Toronto. They're fairly obscure, not well known, but they're exceptional investors. And they started in the private um, world. They started in um, VC and private equity. And they said, hang on a minute it's better to be in the public markets because you get these really wild swings. So we can get in and out much more easily in the public markets because the volumes are there and because the, the trends are, are huge in the yes. public markets. So I, I try to keep that in mind for sure and try to cut against the grain when, when and where I can. And the other thing is too, I mean, it's kind of a cliche quote that gets used a lot, but Warren Buffett's book behind me, he says, you know, be greedy when others are fearful be feel for when they're greedy. I mean, I kind of believe that myself too. If there is a big drop in the US stock market, I believe in buying quality companies. Uh, once it's risen, I am still an investor, but I'm less excited about the purchase than, than at an opportunistic time when other people are actually fearful. So it's kind of about sentiment and experience, I think, with the market, a lot of it. Yeah, and, and just speaking from experience here, when 
when a big sell-off does occur, you may have to ignore those you admire most, and you may have to ignore everybody, the, the people <laughs> on on whatever and wherever, and you may just have to plug your ears, plug your nose, and just start. If you're not confident, just start very small buying um, and and get into it that way. Because it, it is hard to buy. In March 2020, no one wanted to buy anything. And um, fortunately, I did buy quite a bit. We bought two things for the vice president's portfolio at Contra the Herd. Yes. And that was the right thing to do. And I was quite comfortable in that because if I was wrong, I have a long time frame ahead of me and I had quite a bit of cash. So I could just keep buying on the way down. So um, yes. that's that's definitely something difficult to do but it's very worthwhile. And then the flip side happens. Like the, the first quarter of this year here at Contra was crazy because we sold like five or six things in one month after holding them for six years, <laughs> five years, four years. So yeah, yeah the, 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 the way that the swings that markets go through are pretty crazy, that's for sure. So just swinging in that conversation to tie it into maybe the current market here, uh, how do you feel about the current market? I mean, you talked about you sold some things earlier in the year. The market's hitting an all-time high almost every week now which yep. is not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing, depending on how you're looking at it. Um, why don't you give us your view on things? Yeah, so I would say that momentum is very strong, as you just pointed out. And as we've talked about two or three minutes ago, momentum has a lot of inertia behind it. So that's, that's a good thing for markets. Backing that up is a tremendous amount of stimulus being added to the system. Central bankers are creating a lot of cash, and that cash is going into stocks for sure. And there's no two ways about that. On the on the flip side, though, when you look at valuations, valuations are very high, and those valuations apply to almost every single sector and every single stock market. So that's that's something to keep in mind. And valuations eventually win the day. So <laughs> that's an important consideration. The other two things that I think about are debt loads are fairly high as well. Um, the consumer has actually come through this recession, this COVID recession, fairly well. Uh, corporations have done okay, not great, but okay. And then governments have just taken on the biggest amount of debt you could imagine outside of a war. So, yeah, there's a lot of debt out there for sure. And despite this, investors are optimistic. So, on the whole, I would say I'm cautious because I'm more value oriented than momentum oriented. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm happy letting my stocks run but I, I don't jump up and down at, at buying many new companies today. I'm always looking. And if people think they have good companies, they can tell me about it. But uh, <laughs> I'm always uh, thinking about that, but it does look, it's much harder to find good investments today than it was in early 2020. In early 2020, I basically told people close to me who asked me, I said, just buy a quality company. I said, just whatever you believe in and it's a quality company with a success record behind it, if it just dropped a lot, you can choose to buy it. That's the approach I took. Now I'm being really picky and I purchased AMD when they dropped a lot. They've actually rebounded really well and I yeah. felt I could hold them if they didn't. Um, right. But that's a special case because it had dropped a lot. And that's right. You, yeah. you have to be able to decipher that. Otherwise, I feel it's a higher level of risk than it was. Yeah, I would agree there. Yeah. And yeah. I would say to your family or friends that you're telling that if they had bought even just one or two quality companies in March 2020, they would now be sitting on probably a double at minimum. So that's good. Well, for sure. And, and again, when I don't want anyone to thank me for that. That's just the way it works. I mean, you know, Warren Buffett talks about it. Everyone. I'm just repeating it. Um, mm -hmm. and sometimes if you're younger, when I was 25 or 30, I needed someone older to me to say, Hey, I've been through a bunch of cycles and I've successfully gone through a bunch of cycles. I wasn't just bitter and sold off necessarily. I learned from it and then I take their advice. That, that's the approach I've taken. Yeah. And that's what reading does for you. It allows you to, um, learn from others experience. I mean, it's not as good as learning on your own, obviously, but it's, it's right. pretty good. And you could take the ball and run with it. So, I mean, it's getting yeah. good information and adding to it. You always want to be investing in yourself, right? So yeah. um, now let's move to another topic that you brought up with me too. So I'm going to just show on the screen, I showed the two COVID relief bills of almost $2 trillion each, a lot of yeah. debt. I'm showing the stock market chart here, Phil. I just did a basic weekly chart and I'm showing the red arrow uh, for the listeners of the big red, red arrow showing the COVID drop of 2020. Yeah. 
Yes, then there's exactly. an arrow showing the COVID stimulus of 2020 and the, the stimulus of 2021. Now, uh, my question to you is this. So when the 2020 stimulus happened and the 2021 stimulus happened, was I bullish and did I tell people that I felt it would go up? For sure. Um, some people feel that if money is being printed, it automatically means the market will just keep going up. And some people feel the market might not do well if they print too much money. How do you kind of um, maneuver through those things in terms of stimulus and the inflation that it might cause? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, those bills, if they're passed, I don't I don't know. Maybe you know, but it doesn't look like they're they've got the final stamp of approval. I assume they'll be passed at some point, but it's um, it's adding a lot more stimulus to a system that has a lot of stimulus in it. So the the debate still seems to be whether inflation is transitory or sticky and what that means. And on the one hand, you have a lot of articles and investors and economists saying, oh, it's sticky for sure. And here's why. And they bring up various data points. On the other hand, you have the bond market with a yield of 1.3 and inflation in the US of 5.3. So the bond market is saying it's transitory, <laughs> like very, very loudly is saying it's transitory. And I don't know which one will win out. Um, my, my guess is that it will not go back to the 2% range as the central bankers would like. And I think the risk from a central banker's point of view is it runs away on you. I mean, we do live in a fiat currency system and the bias in those systems is for inflation, not, not deflation. Mm -hmm. And the, the central bankers may be making it worse because interest rates are still at record lows and quantitative easing is still, at least in the US, it's going as high as it ever has. So inflation, when it goes, it doesn't kind of go like this. It, it goes like this and it, it just jumps. So that I think is the risk. And if I were a policymaker, I wouldn't be wholeheartedly convinced it's sticky, but I wouldn't be as sanguine as, as many of the Federal Reserve uh, chair people are. Um, so that would be my kind of take from a macro point of view. Um, you asked about portfolio management in that context too, is that right? Yeah, I mean, how do you handle that, right? Because I mean, inflation yeah. inflation is a real thing and you need to account for that, so. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. So I would say two things on this front for, for me personally and for what I'm doing and what we're doing at Contra the Herd. So far this year, I've purchased three companies. And all three of those companies had inflation in mind. One of them was bank stock. One of them was an energy service company. And the final one was a gold company. Okay. So if inflation does uptick in a really big way or it's sticky or it just doesn't go back to the 2% target, which they all want, those stocks should do very well. Those sectors should do very well in an inflationary environment. But if it does go back to 2% or it is transitory, I think those companies should do well anyway. I mean, the bank is in the middle of a turnaround and it's it's got a turnaround strategy in place. They've had a few rough quarters. The energy company, it had a bad acquisition a few years ago and they're working that off and they're slowly diversifying away from oil and gas. So that's a good story. Mm -hmm. And then the gold company has very large expansion projects coming online right now and then over the next few years. So I think all of them should be okay, even if the inflation story doesn't pan out to be a big bogeyman as some people are thinking. And that's the kind of way I like to think about investing in general. I don't want to make a really firm bet on the macro because I know I'm not that right that often. So I want to make sure I'm alive if I get the macro call wrong. <laughs> that's really important to me. And I hope the purchases I've made so far this year help with that. I should also actually mention though, um, the other side of it, because every portfolio you will have stocks, bonds, cash, or some combination. I do have about 30% of my portfolio in cash, which is really high. And part of that is a function of selling so much at the start of this year. We yes. were just selling so much. And now, as I mentioned, it's kind of hard to find new investments because valuations are high. And sometimes people ask me whether I'm worried about that, given inflation could pick up, could be 5% for the next year, something like that. And my answer to that is yes and no. Yes, it's a problem because the inflation will erode the purchasing power of my cash. There's no doubt about that. The cash will drop in value versus goods and services I can buy. 
But if inflation, but then yeah, but then no, because if inflation um, uh, is, is sticky, it will hurt corporate earnings. It will compress multiples. Investors will get fearful and certainty will increase. And many, many things which we've looked at in a low inflationary environment over the past 20 years won't be the same in the future. So I would expect multiples to compress. And when multiples compress, there will naturally be more opportunities where I can go and deploy that cash. So that's how I think about the macro environment today. And when I look at it and I kind of sit back and think about it, I just think to myself, it's another case of economics proving to me that you're damned either way. You hold cash. <laughs> You'll watch the earnings power decrease. You go out and buy all the really expensive stocks today and you watch their valuations compress. So it's a case of pick your poison and try to hazard a guess as to which poison is more palatable for you. And there's no guarantees. Anyone who's confident, you can have confidence, but yeah. there's no guarantees short term. Uh, yeah, short, that's right. Short, short. Yeah, even yeah. long term. Even long term. Even long term. Yeah. yeah. My dad likes to say if you don't get the timing right, you're wrong. So. Yeah. Um, what if they what if they find a lot more gold in a few years i mean you never know yeah. what what will happen yeah. actually right so yeah that's right so yeah, yeah it's, it's really hard to say and, now to, um, to, to tie together what you said i mean i kind of showed this with benj i've got this uh i, I have a hundred trillion dollars right here okay this is a, cool. Zimb a zimbabwe hundred trillion dollar bill i don't expect that to happen to canada's dollar or the american dollar obviously it's just for for uh conversation but it's part of the reason why you said um, it's good to be invested. I own physical silver and gold and different things like that. And those are good too. But if you never have cash or if you never have new cash, you can't take advantage of the next opportunity. Um, I, I don't necessarily tell people to always have 30 or 40 or 50%, but if there's a time to have 30%, it's probably when you might feel the market's becoming overvalued or may eventually become overvalued. So. I don't know what your approach is on that, but I think it's always nice to have a little bit of cash, even if it's not 30%, to have some available for if something happens to take advantage of it. Other people might say that you should always be fully invested or you're not taking advantage of your money. How do you feel about the specific question about cash? Yeah, that's a very good question. And if your portfolio is tiny and you're just starting out and you're... Um, income is such that you can save quite a lot, you probably don't need to hold that much cash. I mean, my younger brother's starting out investing, his portfolio is very small, he's in that position. And if he were to hold 50% cash, well, his next paycheck will double it. So there's not much <laughs> point in him doing that. Um, but if you're a more established investor, if your cash flows can't always pump new money into your portfolio, you do need to think about the cash and you need to, do need to think about the allocation that you put in cash for sure. What, what I do is I look at valuations on a macro level each quarter, and I kind of look back through history and say, um, what have markets done when valuations are like this? And you know, right now the prognostications aren't, aren't that great. So yeah, my, my inclination is to hold more cash. I would love to go out and spend the cash and get more fully invested, but I'm, when I look out, I see some companies that are interesting, but I'm still a little nervous deploying it. And for some people, it's it's just not their thing. They want to be fully invested all the time. A lot of institutional investors are like that. Um, but you know, you just got to find what works for you. And for me, having a certain amount of cash and modifying that cash depending on what the macro valuations are looking like, that works for me. So it's just important to find something that works for your listeners as independent and individual investors. And I agree that I don't even think there's a right or a wrong either. I mean, I just wanted your view on it. Yeah. I think that when they first printed the stimulus in 2020, I wanted almost no cash. Maybe I'd have a little bit if you wanted to just be cautious. But as the stimulus ran out, I actually wanted more cash. And uh, I believe that's kind of the way I feel and maybe you feel right now as well. You mm -hmm. don't mind having 30% cash now but maybe you would have minded six or seven months ago so it's it kind of one of those things and that's up to everyone to decide for them themselves there so yeah that's right yeah there you go um now i wanted to touch on another topic i mean i know you work with benj but you actually mentioned to me that you have your own uh hobby website my money uh moves and i wanted to give you the opportunity i'll oh, pull yeah, it thanks. up on i'll pull it up on screen and then you can maybe discuss that for uh for yeah that, well thank you i appreciate that so yeah, my money moves is it is a hobby website. Um, 
Contra the Herd is a premium subscription-based investment newsletter, and it's intended for the fairly knowledgeable investors out there and the people who have their personal finances in order and, you know, the do-it-yourself investor crowd. That's who Contra the Herd gears its services towards, and it works very well for people who are independent investors and who do have their personal finances in order. My Money Moves is very different. It's entirely free. It's a small hobby website. I put in time when I have time. And it's geared towards novice investors and those who are new to personal finance. And the reason I started this website is I often talk to people and they get super fired up about a stock or an ETF or a cryptocurrency now. And they tell me how they want to invest all their money in it and do the next thing. And they're just super fired up. And I then ask them, okay, um, how are your personal finances looking? What, what are those like? And they look at me like I, like a deer looks into headlights. They just have no idea. And I ask them, have they ever built a balance sheet? And the answer is often no. They don't track their spending. They probably haven't filed their taxes. And then, you know, their credit cards are accruing interest. They're making minimum payments. They have lots of loans. And I think to myself, when I hear stories like this, people really gung-ho about investing, but they don't have personal finance, uh, uh, their personal finances in place, I think that's just very risky because you need to get those things squared away first, in my opinion, anyway. Once you do, once you have your credit cards paid off, once you have your loans under control, once you have an idea of what your net worth is, and how much you're spending each month and whether you owe or are gonna be paid back taxes, now you can proceed from a position of strength and you can be confident in the investments you make. And you won't have to turn around and sell them when they're down 50% and you have to cover your credit cards. So to me, putting investing before putting your personal finances in order is like putting the cart before the horse. And I just think it's unnecessary and dangerous and probably detrimental to the long-term health of somebody's finances. So my money moves is just an attempt to address this issue that I've seen and give people very basic, very simple uh, tools with which to improve their personal finances so that one day they can go out and invest with confidence, be it just passive investing or doing something like Contra the Herd or investing in mutual funds or whatever it may be. And that's the goal of My Money Moves. Okay. And so it's, uh, I guess, a passion project and you feel like, yeah. I guess, you're giving back to people, I guess, and some people that might be confused on certain topics, you're giving some additional input. Yeah, uh, that, that's the goal. And on the website, I have a Excel template and you can download it and you can punch in and figure out what your own net worth is, for example. And I personally used to calculate my net worth every quarter when I was younger. I now find that's overkill. So I don't have time for that, but I still do it once or twice a year. And it's, it's just a very informative exercise, especially when you couple it with uh, just a sense of how much you're saving, how much you're making, how much you owe the government each year, because they're going to come for it no matter what. So it's, it's important to get those things squared away. That's good. That's good. I mean, it's nice that you have a diverse view on um, investing and you're looking at it from all angles, all aspects. And you're looking at it as preservation of capital in a consistent way, rather than maybe trying to run and catch headlines and, and do that type of a thing like a, maybe a trader might do. So it's a completely different perspective. And some people might do a little bit of both, right? They so might, it's, yeah. it's kind of up to everyone else how they want want to uh, do those things. So yeah. And, and on the trading front, I mean, each to their own, there are some excellent traders out there. <clears throat> um, when I look at a stock though, it, it makes very little sense for me to say buy a stock at $10, sell it at 11, buy back at 12, sell it at 15, and so on, as opposed to buying it and then holding it until 30. That, that makes, for me, that makes a lot more sense. My trading fees are lower. If it's in yes. a non registered account, my taxes are lower. And I have to think about it a lot less. I mean, trading all the mm -hmm. time requires a lot of thought. So, it's you nice have, you to, have to manage your positions if you enter them. And if you're always in and out, there's a lot of position management going on. Yeah. Yeah. A huge amount. And there are some people who are truly excellent at it. Um, I know for my own experience that I'm not one of those people, but I'm <laughs> much better just sitting there and holding tight. Yeah. And you know what? I, I try to pick spots when I feel I have the best chance of success. If I'm, uh, I don't day trade anyway, but if I get in after the stimulus last year, I did take profits before the election, for example, and there are times when I do those things, but you don't actually fully know 
that you're going to succeed in that strategy. Unfortunately, it depends on what happens essentially. Yeah, right? that's right. So yeah. You never, you never fully know. <laughs> no, never fully know. Okay. Well, listen, I'm not going to take up too much more of your time. I'm just going to do a quick lightning round with you. If that's okay, we'll ask you a couple yeah, quick, sure. quick yeah. rapid questions and then we'll, uh, we'll send you on your way with some closing comments and we can uh, rewatch this with the whole, the whole audience here. Um, so what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, so we're going to do something called the lightning round here. We're just going to ask you some questions and um, it'll be kind of an A or B type scenario. If you don't want to pick A or B, you can maybe even explain why you would pick okay. one, one over the other or maybe even a combination. Okay, ready to go? Yep, yep, I'm ready. Okay, so the first one here, you kind of mentioned both of these today here. Gold or Bitcoin? I would say gold. Gold? Okay. And is yeah, there a specific yeah. reason in terms of for gold? Um, gold's been around a lot longer and Bitcoin has a lot of hype around it. And I personally find it hard to find a denominator with Bitcoin. Um, the denominator with gold is still harder than with a stock where you can look at its earnings or its sales and use that as a denominator to value it. But um, yeah, Bitcoin, I, I don't really know what it is. Gold, I can hazard a guess though. And I think most people feel that way. I own a bit of both, but I feel that uh, gold is more likely to survive the next 100 or 200 years personally. So I, I agree with you. Um, okay. Tesla or Amazon? Well, I wouldn't personally invest in either of these. Um, I, I don't actually know what I'd do. If I was forced to do this, I'd probably do Amazon. Is what do you I feel do. that the evaluations are high for both companies for you? Yeah, I think so. And as I mentioned, I'm more of a contrary investor. So I, I like things that are being up. Both, I think, are exceptional businesses and have exceptionally bright, motivated leaders. I mean, and I, I'm so glad to see that Elon Musk is one of the richest people in the world. I like that because his cars will make the environment cleaner. He'll help get us into space. And AI will be less of a risk with somebody conscious of the uh, downside effects. So all the power to him. Um, but, uh, and then same with Jeff Bezos, he's obviously trying to get us into space as well, right. which is great. Um, so both of them are wonderful visionaries and excellent entrepreneurs. Um, but I, I would struggle owning either of those stocks. Could I ask you a follow-up? What if the market dropped by like 50 or 60% right now, which one of these would you want to own if they both dropped by that much? Um, if they both drop by that much, I don't know which one I'd want to own more, but I could see owning both of them. That's what, yeah, I agree with that. I could see that. Uh, so yeah, if, if thing, if I would love that, if they both dropped by 50, 60%, that'd be great. <laughs> well, let's hope though the market doesn't crash, but if it does, I think I would probably buy a little bit of both. Um, okay. And then we'll go to the last one here and um, we'll see how this one works here. So stocks or real estate, I do both. And I just wanted to see maybe if you have a preference or if you feel that there's a mixture of both, how you feel about those? I, I would pick stocks. I think over the long run, I think it's fairly well established that real estate outperforms inflation by one or 2% and stocks outperform by four or five. So you add that up over time and stocks should outperform real estate. And that's what I would do. One, I'm a property manager for a living, so I'm a landlord to many. Uh, there's a lot of work going on and there's a lot of people to manage as well. So although real estate is actually a wonderful investment, if you're going to be a landlord, you better be prepared to do the work. Um, yeah. So there are different things that come with it. And with stocks, I believe if you pick the right company, Jeff Bezos is going to do the brunt of the work for you, right? Yeah, that's right. I, I used to be a landlord actually, and I really didn't like it. <laughs> I, I hear you there. There you go. Okay. Well, listen, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for answering the extra questions. And uh, anyone who wants to check out your website or Contra the Herd, I welcome them to go do it. This will be posted on the website. I'll put your information and your website and everything there so everyone can check it out. Um, so again, thank you again for coming on. Do you have any closing comments for everybody? Well, thank you. I've really enjoyed this. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. In addition to checking me out at the sources you just mentioned, people can find me on Twitter. Uh, they can find me on Seeking Alpha. And um, yeah, you can always email me uh, on My Money Moves or through Contra the Herd's website as well or through our YouTube channel. So plenty of ways to get in touch. I'll link some of those things in with your description as well for you, okay? Great, thank you. Okay, thanks for coming out today, Phil, and enjoy the rest of your day, okay? All right, thank you. Mm -hmm.